I'm Eva Gantz, and I lead global community at a nonprofit called Stellar.org. And uh, I've been fortunate enough to devote the last year full time working on uh, economic empowerment through uh, technology. And I'm also a freelance writer on the intersections of tech and social justice, so I'm especially excited to be here today. Uh, so today I'm excited to talk to you about how we can unlock the future of women and money and unlock the future for millions of women together. So I can remember wanting to go to college from the time I was about 11 and I was literally counting down the days. And I, my home was never very financially secure, but I knew that if I could just make it to 18 and get myself to a university, I would be okay. And I didn't worry so much about the academics of getting into college, but I did worry how on earth I was going to pay for all of this. Uh, so I did worry how I was going to pay for it because I didn't have a trust fund and I didn't even really have a piggy bank fund. But luckily for me, I grew up in the United States and I was able to apply for and receive a student loan. And here in the US, our, our perspective on debt skews tends to skew a bit negative. Um, and pictured here are just some quotes about debt and how terrible it is. Uh, and our perspective tends to see it as predatory and something that causes a lot of anxiety. But if you take a look at how access to credit is restricted in various communities all around the world, including here in the US, the opportunity to get a loan is actually an opportunity to independently better your own life. So I'm not going to say that when I look at my negative account balance, I'm happy about it, but I do feel grateful because yes, I worked hard to get my degree, I worked hard to get the loan, and I'm working hard now to pay it off. <laughs> but my counterpart in a lower income community, a woman who wants nothing more than to get to university and independently improve her life, she doesn't get that chance today. For instance, a woman named Georgina Nashipai, at 22, dreamed of going to university and becoming a teacher. And I'm working with Stellar.org because I believe that all of us together can help make the financial landscape fairer for people like Georgina and others like her. So right now, there are 2 billion people around the world exactly like Georgina without access to uh, services like credit, um, even a bank account that many of us here probably tend to take for granted. Uh, in fact, in Detroit, there are one in five families who don't have any kind of formal financial services. And Detroit is the second highest rate of unbanked in the whole US. So if you don't have a credit history, this means that you are basically invisible in the formal financial world. You can't go to school, you can't buy a house, you definitely can't start a business. So you're invisible and you're stuck. So if there's two billion people in this situation around the world, why should we focus particularly on women? Today I wanna to talk about how women interact with the larger global economy, innovative hacks that communities are using to bolster women's success, and most importantly, how all of us can help change that future together. So I'm gonna make a few claims here, and I wanna be clear that these are well-researched claims um, backed by data and respectable sources. There are sources listed on the slides, but I'm also happy to elaborate on the studies more um, if you have questions. So that said, women are awesome with money. And by that, I mean that uh, when women do have financial decision-making power, they tend to be really good savers. And even low-income women and women who don't have a lot of um, steadiness in their finances tend to squirrel away at least 10 to 20% of their earnings. And women are also a safer bet for lenders because they tend to repay loans uh, more reliably. They're also more likely to make equitable decisions for their families. And what I mean by that is a woman choosing to send both her son and her daughter to school, regardless of the perceived difference in earning potentials. And as you might imagine, this results in more opportunity for the entire family. Women are also more likely to invest earnings that they do make back into their families. But women's financial acumen is actually in spite of the current financial structure. So I wanna talk about some of the ways that women are held back in the global economy. They're far less likely to have access to credit. 
and 20% less likely to have a bank account regardless of other factors across the board. So even informal finance is also limited for women. For instance, in Kenya, 40% of small farms are run by women, but they get about 10% of the small loans. There's this old quote that Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did, but she did it backwards and in high heels. When it comes to the global economy, women are dancing backwards in high heels. So they're basically succeeding in spite of restrictions imposed on them. So let's take a look at what that actually looks like, what I mean by dancing in high heels uh, in a global economic sense. So I'm going to run through a couple of the most widespread barriers. Um, don't feel like you have to remember them all. Just try to imagine what would happen if all of these things were stacked against you. So women often need a male relative's permission to even open accounts. And oftentimes, uh, the account that's opened actually isn't ever used by the woman. So this is true with 50 to 70% of loans on the books in Pakistan for women. Women also frequently don't have landowning rights. So in terms of putting up collateral to get a loan, uh, they're frequently not able to do so. And this is true in Burkina Faso, Nigeria, and Zimbabwe, just to name a couple of countries. Women also tend to have limited uh, mobility rights, and you may have heard that this is true in Saudi Arabia with women driving, but there was also a recent incident in the United Kingdom uh, where women in a small religious sect in North London were not able to drive their children to school, and this was in 2015. So all around the world, there's consistent uh, lack of mobility. So if you can't even get to a bank account, you certainly can't open one. Women also tend to not have formal IDs as frequently as men do um, all around the world. And again, if you don't have some kind of verifiable identity, it's near impossible to get a formal financial service. Women also uh, just face greater challenges in getting education all over the world. And one of the most insidious but least talked about obstacles to finance for women is domestic financial abuse. And just to give you an idea of how prevalent this is, one in three women around the world will experience emotional abuse from a partner. Uh, and 98% of those relationships will experience financial abuse. And that just means uh, withholding access to a bank account, forbidding someone to open an account, uh, restricting access to money. And this kind of restriction can have devastating consequences on a woman and her whole family, including the ability to leave that toxic relationship. So all these stacked factors stacked together mean that women simply can't access formal finances often. But I believe that women can have access, and I'm definitely not alone. Communities all over the world are figuring out these innovative ways to get around the formal finance restrictions uh, for women. And one such way is called microfinance. Uh, raise your hand if you've heard of microfinance. Oh, oh, wow, awesome, okay. <laughs> cool, so I'll skip a lot of the education. But as a refresher, um, it basically just means lending in smaller than traditionally uh, thought of amounts for entrepreneurs. Um, and these are typically easier to get than a traditional loan. So a little history, microfinance started with Dr. Muhammad Yunus in a Bangladeshi village where he started experimenting with lending to uh, very poor women. And it ended up being so successful that it spread all over the world. So I want to share a story about a real person, a real woman who was able to achieve a dream via microfinance that she wouldn't have been able to achieve without it. So this is Devi, and she's 29, a proud business owner in Nepal. And Devi took out an initial loan of the equivalent of about 350 US dollars. And with that loan, she built a thriving beauty supply shop. And when that succeeded, she took out another loan, and then a third, and her latest venture is the chick business, and she raises these chicks and sells them uh, for a profit in the market. So Debbie was able to achieve this thing that she'd always dreamed of doing, and in her own words, when a woman owns a business, she's kept in the decision-making circle of the family. So this is awesome, but would everyone in... Devi's village be able to start a business if they wanted? Can everyone get microcredit who needs it? Data from the World Bank which suggests that this is not the case. So 160 million people have been served by microfinance. And I want to say that that is it's huge, it's amazing. But if you look at it as a fraction of the larger 2 billion unbanked, 
you can see that there's still a huge opportunity for growth. So how can we help solutions like microfinance that are already happening on their own scale faster? What kind of technology can we use? So Stellar is an open financial network for the world that uh, basically helps solutions like microfinance scale. And it does this by uh, providing free to low cost infrastructure, the back end for uh, local services to build on top of. So microfinance institutions are already getting excited about uh, this open free network supported by a nonprofit and they're building software. So for instance, this place in Nigeria called Aradian, um, a software company, is building something that makes transactions really simple in between these different microfinance institutions. And the reason this is needed is frequently uh, these transactions take place literally on a bus, um, a physical bus ride. So they load up the cash, drive about 12 hours, and then deliver the cash physically. So it's costly. It's sometimes even dangerous. Um, so they're really excited about plugging into this free open network. So an open financial network in itself can also help women uh, entrepreneurs succeed simply just by virtue of uh, the low transaction cost seamless international payments, and near-instant transactions. And those benefits could be the difference that helps a female-owned business survive. Oh, boy. So we've talked a bit about uh, the tech, or I'm sorry, the social implications of what an open network for money could do. But what does this actually look like? What does it uh, do? <laughs> and what's under the hood? Um, and pictured here is a pug with its head tilting because that's, you know, that's how people usually feel when they hear about it first. <laughs> so under the hood, Stellar is the first of its kind distributed, decentralized, peer-to-peer -peer network. So it's basically uh, accessible and open and free for absolutely anyone to use. And you plug into it and you can transact with absolutely anyone else on the network. And it's instant in any currency and free. So this means that I could send you dollars and you could receive it in pounds in just seconds. And these multi-currency transactions are powered by a peer-to-peer -peer distributed marketplace that's baked in at a protocol level. So a little bit of the architecture of how the network works. The base layer, the Stellar network itself, is made up of these distributed decentralized nodes that talk to each other um, and they all agree on a distributed I'm sorry, an agreed upon database. And they all store this database and stay in sync with each other via a consensus algorithm called Stellar Consensus Protocol. Uh, it's pretty new, it came out this March. Happy to point you to resources on the 50 page white paper <laughs> uh, or the graphic novel that explains it in sort of a more accessible way. <laughs> um, but for now, let's just say all these nodes agree with each other. So that is the Stellar network and that is it. Everything else is an app or a service built on top to let people interact with the protocol. So next up are gateways, and these are entities that actually get the money onto the network. So they accept deposits and record those digitally on the network. And any licensed money service uh, business can be a gateway. So mobile money provider, a microfinance institution, a bank, a credit union, they can all join. And again, it's free and not permissioned in any way. Clicker. So the final level is users and services uh, that are built on top of the network or accessing the network through these gateways or directly from the nodes. And entrepreneurs, local people, uh, local financial entrepreneurs and innovators can build their own services at a local level. And this is important because the people who are going to be using a financial service or any service for that matter should be the same people who are building it. So if you think that this architecture looks suspiciously similar to how the internet works, you would be right. Because we need financial infrastructure to behave more like the internet. Take a minute to imagine all of the accessibility and innovation that the internet has brought to global communication, just person to person, all over the world. And imagine if that could come to money. So we've talked a bit about how Stellar can help solutions like microfinance scale to help provide uh, not well-served communities with credit. But couldn't an open, free financial network do more? Yes. <laughs> so simply put, Stellar unlocks potential. Uh, one such 
uh, innovation that the network can bring about is for remittances, which are essentially cross-border payments, um, person to person, not corporate. So the remittance market is $582 billion in a single year. And last year, uh, we spent $44 billion just on the fees. So just fees, wasted, loss, just moving our own money around. And these came out of the pockets of some of the world's uh, most, the people who need it most, people who are working and trying to send money home to their families. So uh, our co-founder of Stellar.org, Joyce Kim, spoke at the, uh, the UN on how Stellar can unlock remittances through this peer-to-peer -peer distributed marketplace where international payments are free, instant, and happen at a protocol level. Stellar also can unlock savings. So for instance, right now, a nonprofit in South Africa is building a wallet for young girls and women to save right from their phones. So we're probably familiar with mobile money in the sense of you know, Square Cash or PayPal. Um, this would work somewhat similarly, but the girls could save in local South African Rand and airtime minutes right from the same wallet. And these wallets are all free because um, it's also a nonprofit serving them. So the really cool thing about this is the end goal is not savings. It's been proven that women and young girls who are able to save formally stay in school at least six months longer, have better health outcomes, and participate more in the global formal economy when they grow up. So this isn't just about savings. It's about improving their whole lives. One of the coolest things about Stellar, in my opinion, is that it unlocks a network effect. So once you're plugged into the network, like the internet, you're connected with every other institution and person on the network. So keeping all of this potential for global change in mind, what would a future with Stellar, with an open financial network for the world, look like? It looks like more access to these services all around the world, decreased poverty, and uh, people living longer and more self-directed lives. Okay, so we're going to move it right along um, and say that you can get involved by uh, joining our communities. Um, you can build your own app and extend access to people who need it um, for your own communities. And feel free to join our chat at slack.stellar.org. And thank you so much.